Hello everyone, my name is Patrick. I'm a software developer based in London. And today we're going to talk about how we implement the federation support in a code first GraphQL server. We're also going to discuss what schema directives are and how we can take advantage of them when using a code first approach. But before doing that, let me introduce what Sorberry GraphQL is. Sorberry GraphQL is a Python library that I created a few years ago when I wanted to experiment with Python's type-ins. In fact, Sorberry GraphQL makes use of Python type-ins to allow to easily create GraphQL types and APIs from Python code. Type-ins in Python basically allow you to annotate Python code with types. So let's see an example of that. Here we have a function called hello world that accepts one parameter name, of type string, and returns nothing. Python itself doesn't really do anything with these annotations. So for example, we can still do this. We are calling the hello world function, passing it the name parameter equal to three, which is not a string. And this is still going to work at runtime, but it's not going to complain. It's gonna, not going to say anything. But that doesn't mean that type-ins are useless. In fact, there's a few things that you can do with them. For example, you can use type checkers like MyPy and PyWrite to statically type check your code for typing issues. And this is quite powerful because it allows you to find bugs quite easily and you don't really have to write tests for uh, like passing the wrong types and things like that. And in addition to that, like the ID integrations allow you to find bugs immediately as you write code, and it also helps with um, auto completion. And finally, you can also use these type ins at runtime. So here, for example, we have the final class with one property of type integer, and we're using the dunder annotation magic method to get the list of properties for this class. In this case, it's just here, and we can see that it has a class of uh, integer. This is basically what makes so very possible. So let's see how you can define GraphQL types using server. In this example, we are defining a user type that's two fields, the ID of type ID and the age of type int. The server type decorator reads the type ins at runtime and it creates GraphQL types based on them. I personally find this syntax very neat and very similar to the SDL, the SDL that you would write when using a schema first library. Um, but also give you advantage of basically being able to use the type annotations in Python. So when using this Python code, you take advantage of the auto-completion and the type checking. Okay, before talking about federation, let's see how we, we can implement resolve raising in Strawberry. This is going to be useful to understand some of the nuances of schema directives. Resolve and Strawberry are basically Python functions. Let's see an example of that. So here we have the same user type, but let's say that we also want to define a query that has a get user field. The syntax for defining the type in fields is the same as before, but now we're also using a Strawberry field function we use this function to add more information about a field. For example, we can use it to change the name, or we can also use it, for example, in this case, to add a resolver to a field. As mentioned, the resolver are basically Python functions. Here we have a resolver that accepts one ID and returns a user. So Ray knows how to read arguments from functions and how to attach them to the GraphQL field. This is how our schema directive uh, schema is going to look like. Uh, as you've seen, we have the same type user as before, but we also have the query type, which has a get field, a get user field, and it requires an ID parameter of type ID. We're going to get back to Strawberry in just a bit, but for now, let's see what federation is. To put it simply, a ball of federation is a way to combine multiple GraphQL APIs into one. So you can have an architecture based on microservices while still having our clients using a single graph to access all the resources of the API. So this could be a architecture based on Apollo Federation. For example, here, you have three microservices, products, reviews, and inventory. And we have two clients, a web application, and an iOS application. In the middle, there is our gateway. This is basically combining all our API into one. I'm not gonna go into the details of why you should use Federation. I think it's a pretty neat architecture and there's plenty of talks on that. Instead, let's see how federation works. Let's see how Apollo federation works with a simplified example of what we had before. Let's say that we have two microservices, products and reviews, and we want to combine them. The product microservice is gonna look like this. It has a query, which allows to fetch the top products, uh, a list of top products, and then we have type product, which has three fields, UPC, name, and price. Then we have the reuse microservice and it's a very simple uh, service. It has only one type, which is review, and it has one field called body. Ideally, we want to merge these two services together to have one single graph, uh, which we can call the compose schema. So just like the product service, we have a query that allows to fetch the products, but we also have a now a new field on the product type, which is a list of reviews. And of course, we also, want, we also have the review type in our schema. 
In order to combine the two schemas, we need to use some of that is defined by the Apollo Federation pro protocol. So as mentioned before, Apollo Federation merges multiple schema into one and also allows XM types defining one service from another service. And it does this by using directives. So in our example, we wanted to be able to extend the product type and add the reviews field. In order to do that, we need to change our product schema from this to this. The difference is pretty small. In fact, we only added one directive to the product type, which is the keys fields, keys fields you can see. The key directive makes a GraphQL type an entity, which is basically this, this type can be extended from other services. You can think of this as a primary key for your GraphQL type. So now we are able to extend the product type from the review services. Let's see how we can do that. We still have the reviews, the reviews type, but we also have the, a new type called product, which has a new field called UPC and a field called reviews. There's a couple of things happening here. The first thing is that we're declaring the product type as an extension using the extend keyword. This basically tells the Apollo Federation that this type is an extension of the original product type. And in addition to that, we're also passing the key directive again. This has to match the key defined in the original, original type, otherwise the Apollo Federation uh, is not going to work. We also now have a field called UPC that is marked as external using the external directive. This tells Federation that this field is coming from another service. So when we are going to use product inside the review service, we are never going to have the UPC because it's coming from another service. So as we have seen, Apollo Federation relies a lot on, on directives. Let's see what, what directives are. The GraphQL specs defines GraphQL as a way to describe alternate runtime execution and type validation behavior in a GraphQL document. This is quite hard to say, and it's, to be honest, it's a bit hard to understand, at least for me. Uh, my personal definition is directives allow you to change what, what a GraphQL server returns, at least in, based on the description from the GraphQL spec. And the GraphQL spec does include some directives that reflect that definition. So, um, there are two directives in, um, in the GraphQL spec, which are include and skip directives. They basically allow to change what the GraphQL API returns based on variable. Let's see an example. Here we are defining a query that conditionally fetches the reviews of products based on the variable passed to the query. As mentioned in the GraphQL spec, the include directive here changes how the execution is done. So if we are passing fetch reviews as true, the reviews resolver is going to be Called. Otherwise, it's not going to be called. But this is quite different from what Apollo, um, the Apollo Federation do. In, in fact, we can say that there are actually different types of directives. Client directives and schema directives. Client directives allow to change execution and behavior of the GraphQL server, and they're used when sending queries from the clients, hence the name. In the meanwhile, schema directives are directives that are used directly on the, the SDL when defining the schema. Interestingly, the GraphQL spec don't do any distinction around these two types of directives, but it does define a couple of directives that can be considered uh, schema directives. And one of them is the deprecated directive. As you can guess from the name, this directive marks a field as deprecated. You can see this being used in uh, graphical to show that the field is deprecated, so you don't, don't use it in future. But let's see now what kind of use case schema directives are. Schema directives are usually used in combination with schema-first GraphQL libraries. They allow to transform the schema and the resolver. Let's see an example here. Here we have a schema to test a list of, pers of people and as a type people. And the people field is using a, a directory called REST and we're passing a URL. This directory could be implemented in a way that has a resolver to the field to do an API call to the endpoint defining the URL parameter. And you can even change the schema to add pagination, for example. Previously, we mentioned Strawberry, which is a code-first library. Does it still make sense to use schema directives for code-first libraries? When dealing with code-first framework, you don't really need to use directives if you need reusable ways to define resolver, I mean to change the schema and types. Let's see how we can implement the previous example with Strawberry. Here, for example, instead of creating a custom resolver for people, we are using a function that we generate a resolver for us instead. We don't have the extra step for adding a directive to the schema and defining the transformation function for the directive. So does it make sense to talk about schema decks in code first frameworks? To answer that question, let's start by seeing how Apollo Federation survey works. Let's go back to our previous uh, microservice for reviews. Our schema looks like this. 
Um, so we have the type review and you also have the extension of the type product. And this will look like this in, in Strawberry. So we have the same type review as before, but we also have the um, product type, which is using this new decorator called Strawberry Federation type, uh, which is basically an extension of the original Strawberry type made for Federation. And as you can see, we aren't really passing any directly to our fields and types. This is because we decided to make Federation a first, first class citizen in Strawberry, and we wanted to take advantage of code first approach by providing helper to create federated types and fields. So to answer our question, maybe schema directing don't really make sense in code first framework, but that's not the full story. I think schema directives might make a lot of sense in code first framework too, especially in combination with Graphql tools. Let's see how Apollo makes use of schema directives. Apollo provides a gateway that knows how to combine multiple schema into one. Let's say that we implement a gateway for the services that we discussed before. Here we are instantiating a gateway and passing the reviews and product service definition. When the gateway starts, it makes a graphical call called to each service to fetch the schema. Then it reads, parses, and measures them to make a composed graphical schema. And in addition to that, we will also use the schema directive to find the schemas to have information on how to do request advancing services. For example, when you receive this query, it knows that it needs to first fetch the top products from the product service and then to fetch the review for each product from the review service. So as you can see, Apollo Federation uses schema directives to gain more information about a schema and its types and fields. So schema directives can be used to add metadata to a schema. Let's see another example of this. So if you've been following the latest GraphQL updates, you might have seen this new directive to add a specification URL to a scholar, um, which is basically telling GraphQL tools or even user of a schema uh, where the actual definition of a scholar is. So for example, here we can have a UID scholar that we could point to the RFC for the UID specification. Uh, so it seems that also GraphQL and the GraphQL spec are adopting uh, schema directive for metadata more and more, which is quite cool. There's also another cool directive from, from Apollo and it's being used in the Apollo Federation tool, Manage Federation tool, uh, and it's the contact directive. This contact directive allows to add information about a schema owner. For example, here we are defining a schema for the product service and we are adding a contact directive to basically uh, saying that this, um, the point of contact for this schema is the product theme and then we define the URL in the description. And Apollo Studio, which is the managed federation service, is basically using this information to show additional information on the, on, on the service on, on, on their UI. So here, for example, you can see that there is a type furniture which comes from the product sub subgraph, and you can see that there is also a link to the product theme. Let's see also another example, which I think it might be quite cool. So let's say that we define a sensitive directive. We could define the schema directive that marks a field or even a type of sensitive, and then we can use this information to like send you a data dog to prevent these fields from being logged. This is something I had to do manually at work. Uh, it was quite annoying to basically go and have a a uh, allow list of, of, of types, uh, sorry, uh, types and fields to basically, you know, send them to, to, to Sentry. So having something like this would have been really, really useful. So schema directives enable tools to learn more about a schema. And I personally think that this is quite powerful because it, it can introduce new use cases and tools that work with schema. Now let's see how we implemented support for schema directly in Strawberry, and we'll focus on how we implemented them in the context of Apollo Federation. So Strawberry did have Federation support for quite a long time, but the first implementation was far from ideal. What we were doing was basically a hack. Our Strawberry type decorator was actually accepting a Federation argument where we passed the metadata about uh, Apollo Federation. And our Strawberry Federation type decorator was basically creating an instance of this metadata class. And in addition to that, we also implemented a printer that knew how to print federation directives coming from that metadata. Our printer function for the fields will look like this. As you can see, we print all the information, and then we have two function calls for printing the federation directives and the deprecated directives. Having a doc metadata on our types and fields and having a printer that relies on the metadata isn't really ideal. It meant that we didn't actually have support for schema directives. So we changed that. I personally think that we can make good use of schema directives, especially in future. 
So I thought it would make sense to rework our federation implementation to be based on proper schema directives. So now instead of passing federation metadata, we pass directories. So as you can see now, instead of passing the, the metadata as I just said, we pass a generic list of directives and our survey federation type creates instance of those directives. And finally, we also create schema directives using, using the new survey schema directive decorator for the federation directive. For example, here, um, this is how we could implement the schema directives for the Apollo Federation key directive. We, we basically define a class and we pass in the, um, all the parameters that are needed to create the, the directive. We still have the survival federation type because like, implementing the federation in the schema directive doesn't mean that it doesn't make, it, it makes sense to remove the, the, the helpers. I think it still makes sense to take advantage of Python to make it easier to define federation type. But now we first class support of schema directory, we also have more flexibility. The first advantage is that we can now support new schema directives. So we can allow users of survey to create their own custom directives, but we can also easily implement new one. For example, the contact directive that we just said that could be implemented in just a few lines. And also now we can use Apollo Federation with our extensions. Like for example, we have an extension for, for Django that didn't have support for federation, but now we can pass schema directives like this. So let's say that we creating, want to create a type from a product model coming from a Django product model, and we want to pass the key, key equal to ID. We can do this by passing the directives directly to the survey Django.type decorator instead of creating a custom one or using the um, ad hoc metadata for federation. And there's probably more things we can do. I'm quite excited to have support for schema direct in Survey, as this will enable new features and integration with other tools. And there's also another thing I'm wondering about is whether we could use schema direct to also alter the execution runtime or, or maybe you know just log things. Um, as I mentioned before, this might not make a lot of sense with code first frameworks, as you can easily make a resolver usable. But maybe there's something I'm missing. I don't know. We I guess we'll see in future. But hopefully this was useful to someone. It definitely helped me to make survey more extensible and I can't wait to implement more schema directives. Please do reach out if you have any questions, ideas, suggestions regarding schema directives or survey in general. Um, and thank you for listening to this talk. You can reach me on Twitter and on my personal website. See you soon. Bye.